Okay, so um, today's going to be a little bit uh, less like a mini course talk and a little bit more like a colloquium talk in that I'm going to try to survey um, some recent developments for you. But I'll, I'll start off by reminding you where we were last time. Um, so uh, last time we discussed the theorem of Eskin, Mizukani, Mohammadi that says that uh, GL2R orbit closures of translation surfaces are manifolds cut out by uh, linear equations in uh, local coordinates. OK, and just a few remarks on this that I didn't have time uh, to make last time. So remarks. One, um, the uh, coefficients um, must be real, and the constant term 0. Okay. For, um, so I guess it's a consequence of this theorem, but this is sort of trivial. There's an exercise to do, which is take um, any subset of c to the n defined by linear equations that's invariant under GL2R, acting diagonally on each copy. Okay, well then all of the linear equations have real coefficients, or can be assumed to have real coefficients, um, and they're homogeneous. They have zero constant term. And, and that's equivalent to this, uh, just this sort of trivial statement about GL2R acting on c to the n. Um, uh, another remark, just sort of a, a trivial one. So uh, these have a complex structure. They're, they're complex manifolds or complex orbifolds because the solutions to real linear equations in these complex local co coordinates. And the, the complex dimension is always at least two. Um, and that's pretty easy. That's because GL2R has uh, real dimension four. So GL2R orbits on their own locally already have complex dimension 2. Um, uh, so you, you can't get any smaller than that. Uh, the case of uh, dimension exactly equal to 2 is the case of uh, closed GL2R orbits, which we discussed a little bit. Um, and uh, so the next statement is examples come in what might be called commensurability classes. Um, related by branch covering constructions. which is to say if you have one GL2R orbit closure and you look at all surfaces that you obtain as whatever degree 11 covers of translation surfaces in that orbit closure, you'll get a new GL2R orbit closure. But um, in each commensurability class, there's sort of a unique primitive representative in sort of in smallest genus. Uh, and so we're still at the stage where we don't understand these things super well, so um, generally I'll consider things that are commensurable to be the same, okay, from my current point of view, far away. There, are, there is, of course, interesting combinatorics in terms of how you set up these covers. Um, and we did an example of that last time. Recall we thought about um, four to one covers of the torus. So in fact, I would say 
this orbit closure is commensurable to the whole moduli space of genus one surfaces. Um, so four. Uh, so there are some trivial orbit closures, which are strata, so whole moduli spaces, and the commensur their commensurability classes. So a whole stratum is obviously a GL2R invariant manifold. It's an orbit closure, too, because the action is ergodic. Um, uh, uh, and, and here you can also take strata of quadratic differentials. And then you look at sort of the double covers of them that are abelian differentials. And that, I would say that also would give sort of a trivial orbit closure. Although, again, there can be interesting combinatorics. Um, okay, so a final remark. Um, uh, the coefficients of these linear equations can be taken in Q bar. Or they can be real, so Q bar intersect R. So they have to have algebraic coefficients. Or you, I mean, you can always take a linear equation and multiply it by pi, or i times pi. But the, the point is you can find an equivalent set of linear equations with coefficients uh, that are algebraic numbers. Okay, and in particular, um, that implies only countably many orbit closures, okay, because there are only countably many algebraic numbers, and so there are only countably many linear equations defined by algebraic numbers. Okay, so there's some countable set of orbit closures. So that follows from my result that the, the coefficients can be taken to be in Q bar, but it was actually, there was a more complicated proof of that that was part of uh, this. Um, OK, so uh, because there are only countably many, you can hope to make a list. OK. Uh, so that's, that's what I wanted to say about Eskin, Mirzakhani, Mohammadi. Um, so as I said today, mostly I'm going to just tell you about results. But I want to sort of explain one more thing to you in detail. I want to give you a little primer on the dynamics of um, the one parameter subgroup UT01 to give you a little bit of a feel for it before we get to the sort of more advanced results. So sometimes this is called Teich Muller Hora cycle flow in the same way that e to the t 0, 0, e to the minus t was called Teich Muller geodesic flow. Um, uh, so there are a few things I can tell you about this. Um, one is. Um, if x omega is not the union of horizontal cylinders, then ut x omega is unbounded. The UT orbit is unbounded in, in the stratum. Okay, so first of all, this condition about cylinders. So let's go back to one of our favorite examples, the regular octagon with opposite sides identified. So um, here in the middle, I see a rectangle with two opposite sides identified. That's a, rec that's a, that's a horizontal cylinder. Okay? Um, so all of these horizontal trajectories, uh, all these horizontal straight lines close up. Um, there's actually another one, although it's a little bit less obvious. It's helpful if you think about, uh, maybe I'll start here and I'll flow in this direction. So that's identified down there. So I sort of flow along here. And that's identified there. And when I flow, I close up. 
good. So this whole thing. That's a second cylinder. It's also horizontal. Um, and when you horse cycle flow, so you sort of, you're shearing this, what that is the effect of is essentially twisting the cylinders. And you see, as you twist the cylinders, you're never really going to develop a short saddle connection. Because um, there's, no, there's never going to be any short vertical saddle connection, because the lengths of the verticals are not changing. And any other saddle connection would have to cross a cylinder. And the height is not changing as you shear it. Okay, So it's, it's sort of very easy that um, if you're built out of horizontal cylinders, um, then, uh, uh, then your orbit is actually bounded. So let's just think about the other direction. Uh, assume. Um, X omega is not horizontally periodic. And this will just be a sketch. Um, uh, so not horizontally periodic. Sorry, I'm, I should stick to the same, same terminology. I mean not the union of horizontal cylinders. So not all horizontal straight lines are, are periodic. Um, you can get things of every genus. Yeah, you can get every, things in every stratum that are horizontally periodic. Okay. And it's also worth mentioning, not every, um, not every surface has a horizontal cylinder at all. Indeed, this won't if I just rotate it the right amount. But every surface has tons of cylinders, infinitely many. They get long and thin, so they're more like sort of these thin ribbons that sort of go around and eventually close up. But it's a non-trivial theorem that every surface has infinitely many cylinders. Um, okay, So assume it's not horizontally periodic. Um, so you can show that that's equivalent to there being some singularity of the metric um, where I can take, let me just draw like this, some singularity where I can take a little sort of horizontal line and um, Paths from that don't close up. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to take a little rectangle, very thin, and I'm going to flow it um, until eventually it hits some other, some other uh, singularity of the metric. Okay, it might come back to the same one. It has to eventually do something, because as I make this rectangle longer and longer, it eats up more area. But the surface has finite area. Okay. And the only thing I'm going to use is I'm going to use it's not horizontally periodic, so I can set this up so it doesn't come back exactly there. It's OK if it comes back sort of overlapping, but not, not exactly. So you end up with a situation where you have this sort of long, thin rectangle, one singularity there and one singularity there. And then in that rectangle, I can draw a saddle connection, which is a straight line segment joining two zeros. So what I've shown is for all epsilon, there exists a saddle connection um, uh, with um, sort of complex length x plus i y, and y is less than epsilon, but y is not 0. And the fact that y is not 0 is the fact that this doesn't come back exactly to itself. If this 0 was right there, then that would be y is 0. OK. So um, now I'm going to pick t so that 1 t 0 1 x y is 0 y. So then um, ut of x omega 
Well, so that just shears the saddle connection, and then it'll have a very tiny short, short saddle connection. So ut x omega has a saddle connection of length less than epsilon. And I can do this for any epsilon. Okay. So that means the, the ut orbit is unbounded. An orbit is unbounded, a set is unbounded, if somewhere in that set you can find a saddle connection that's arbitrarily small. That's that's the whole proof. Questions? Should we think about these things that have that our union is a horizontal cylinder that's being these primi primitive 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 classes? Um orbital closed? Are they essential? So it turns out, although it's not obvious, every GL2 orbit closure will contain a surface like this. Um, it's it's not related to primitivity. The generic thing in a GL2 orbit somehow won't have any horizontal cylinders. Um, even if you found one, you could rotate it, and then it, it would have cylinders in some other direction. Other questions? Oh, wait, the reason I told you this is it's, well, A, it's relatively easy, and B, it connects the dynamics of UT, just the fact these orbits are unbounded, to cylinders on a surface. And so it'll um, make what I tell you n next a little bit more plausible. Um, uh, so, um, for any x omega, if c is the collection of all cylinders in some direction on x omega. Um, and utc is the result of shearing all those cylinders then utc of x omega is in the gl to r orbit closure Okay, so I think it, this will become much more clear with an example. Um, so let's build an example with. Um, uh, I don't understand something about the state. So if you're acting on okay, you're going to be the No, no, no. Be, um, let, let me do an example. Well, that's the result, not the actual equation. So this cylinder deformation is not just the GL to our action. If you'd like, it's somehow part of the GL to our action applied to just these cylinders, which sort of don't have to be the whole surface. OK. So a good example is take the torus and pick an irrational direction and make a slit and glue in a cylinder. Um, So here's the torus. I make a slit. If you'd like, I can sort of identify the two edges of that slit. And then it sort of looks like this. And then I glue in a cylinder into that. Um, this is a, it, the cylinder. It doesn't have to be horizontal. It could be in any direction. Um, and since this is an irrational direction, there's no other parallel cylinder here. Okay. So what this theorem is saying is it says I can shear this cylinder and it'll stay in the orbit closure. So shearing the cylinder looks like doing something like that. Okay, it's actually somehow very 
concrete, right? Um, a cylinder somehow looks like this, and you should think of it. You have a cylinder. I'm going to build a set of two pieces of paper. Okay, so here's my cylinder. Okay, it lives in the surface, so there are some chunks of this that are glued into the rest of the surface. There might be more than one saddle connection they're glued in somehow. So I'm going to shear it. That looks like this. It's still a cylinder, but somehow the relative position of these intervals to these intervals have changed. Um, so if I did enough shearing, I'd sort of go around and come back to where I started. But in between, this is some thing. And I, so I can sort of twist and then just glue it back in the same way to my surface as before. I have to find the notes for my talk. I <laughs> use different paper. Um, so you can see that. Uh, Unless the cylinders cover the whole surface, these deformations are not actually in the GL2R orbit. Okay, if I sheared the whole surface, um, so if I did this thing to the whole surface, that would be in the GL2R orbit. Um, but I'm just doing it to part of it. Now, if there are two cylinders, so maybe I have another cylinder here. That's parallel. Uh, sorry, it doesn't look exactly parallel. I have to do the same shearing to both of them. It's this way, you have to shear all of the cylinders in the same direction. If uh, the cylinders cover the surface in the given direction, then I'm shearing all of them, so I'm just shearing the, same, the whole surface. Then it's trivial. Okay. So ut x, utc x omega is in the GL to our orbit rather than the orbit closure, um, if and only if C covers x omega. So the union of the cylinders is the whole thing. Okay, so if I did it here, I'd have to shear both horizontal cylinders the same amount. I'd just be shearing the whole surface. It wouldn't tell me anything I didn't know before. Okay. And by the way, it's easy to show that if you shear, you can also stretch. So I can make the cylinders longer. Although, again, I have to do it by the same factor to every cylinder. So I can make all the cylinders twice as long in a given direction. Um, so these are somehow geometric deformations. They stay in the orbit closure, but not in the orbit. Uh, um, so uh, yeah, this theorem is proven using the dynamics of the Hora cycle flow, using something called quantitative recurrence. Um, and it's. Uh, inspired by what's now a theorem of Simeon Philippe, which is the fact that orbit closures are varieties. Um, so somehow the fact that the structure at infinity is tractable leads you to suspect that this would be true. Um, And somehow this theorem gives you a good hope of being able to compute some orbit closures. They are, but we don't know what manifolds there are. Uh, so the space is not bounded. So Gaga does not tell you automatically that manifolds are varieties. Right, so if it was, if, it, if if I was inside of PN, inside of projective space, then I would know by general principles that a complex submanifold had to be a variety. They're cut out by linear equations. In periods, periods are transcendental functions. I mean, periods are literally integrals of omega. Integrals in math are like the prototypical transcendental functions. Um, Yeah, a non-algebraic change of coordinates uh, to sort of access the variety structure of MG or of the Hodge bundle. Um, now, that being said, you strongly believe that orbit closures should be varieties. 
because they're finite vol they have some volume form, and they're finite volume manifolds. And if you know about Gega, you know that um, you know, complex manifolds are varieties unless they some have some sort of essential singularity at infinity, some sort of really crazy behavior. But finite volume things shouldn't have like some essential singularity that should somehow use up infinite volume. Yep. Uh, real linear equations on complex coordinates. So it's as simple as, um, so maybe I take like C2 and I look at the equation Z1 plus 3Z2 equals 0. That defines a complex submanifold. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions? Okay, so I was saying the cylinder deformation theorem sort of gives you hope that um, you can compute orbit closures. For example, it's actually a pretty easy exercise to show that this has full orbit closure. So its orbit closure is dense um, using the cylinder deformation theorem. You just have to find enough cylinder deformations. Um, like there's another cylinder, say, here. There's a cylinder. And maybe it's parallel parallel to some other cylinder, but if you do some little deformation here, then it won't be parallel to another cylinder. So you can just, the deformations in this, the deformations in this, and GL2R already give you a neighborhood of that point. Um, so you can somehow hope to actually compute some, some orbit closures. Mm -hmm. I'm not exactly sure I understand the, the question. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, already this is proven using dynamics. And I'll give examples later of more things that are proven using dynamics. Yeah, it tells you a lot about the geometry of MG um, and about dynamics on Riemann surfaces. Sort of depends on what sort of question you're asking. If you're asking the right sort of question, it's equivalent to things about things on Riemann surfaces tend to be studied using the, the space of Riemann surfaces. Um, and this tells you all sorts of things about the space of Riemann surfaces. Okay. So, um, I want to give you a little bit of a census of orbit closures uh, from the point of view of four years ago or about four years ago. So I'm being a little bit ahistorical, because most of what I just talked about happened in the last four years. Um, but now I'll fill in some of the history. Well, they're very different. If you just apply it to the cylinders, um, you stay in a bounded set, in the same way that I explained that the UT orbits are bounded, if, if your surface is made out of cylinders. Um, but if you apply UT to the whole surface, it'll typically be unbounded. Um, yes. That's essentially, the proof involves thinking about the UT orbit of the whole surface and seeing that accumulate on horizontally periodic surfaces and then making some arguments near the horizontally periodic surfaces. So essentially, you produce this deformation at a point in the UT orbit closure of that surface, and then you parallel translate the deformation back. But I don't want to give the proof of this now. That would occupy the whole, whole lecture or more. Um, 
So I want to say uh, what we know, of, what orbit closures we knew four years ago. So first of all, we knew the trivial ones. Okay. Um, so everything commensurable to a whole stratum of abelian or quadratic differentials. Um, two, we knew the Veach. Well, so maybe I'll do this one name at a time. So Veach showed that the regular n-gon, um, or I should say 2n-gon, uh, has closed orbit. And he did this via direct computation. He computed the stabilizer in SL2R and showed that it was a lattice. Um, uh, but this was a big surprise. It has miraculous consequences. His student, Ward, found a few more examples like this. Um, and then decades later, uh, Bau and Moeller, using a pretty sophisticated um, argument uh, in algebraic geometry, extended this to its slightly bigger family. Right? So this, this, this whole family gives finitely many, many closed orbits in each genus. So it's an infinite family, but it's only finitely many in each genus. Um, uh, and already, I mean, it was an annals paper for Bowen Muller to sort of extend the family from a one-parameter family to a two-parameter family. Um, uh, so uh, three, there are what we now call the eigenform loci, which were discovered by uh, McMullen. And uh, some of them were discovered in a different guise by Kalta. And again, this was pretty exciting at the time. These were like, I think, two jams papers um, when they were discovered. Um, and uh, so these are closed orbits and some bigger orbit closures. in genus less than or equal to 5. The closed orbits are in genus less than or equal to 4, and then there are some bigger ones also. Um, uh, so these days, we understand these very well. And in fact, you can prove they exist with like a page of linear algebra. Um, uh, but they're, they're sort of weird and unexpected. Um, essentially, they exploit a genus 2 phenomenon. Okay, there's some miracle of linear algebra uh, in, in genus 2. You can try to make the same construction in higher genera, and it doesn't, it just doesn't work. So the eigenform refers to eigenforms For real multiplication. Okay, so these are um, almost but not quite parameterized by Hilbert modular surfaces. Um, yeah. And it's to be emphasized, all of these examples are like really interesting. We give rise to really interesting examples of MG, some of which have, that have already been studied and some of which that are studied as soon as you found them for their own sake, even if they weren't gl to r invariant. They, you know, these orbit closures tend to be independently interesting things, um, even if you don't care about dynamics, although I hope you do. Um, all right. Uh, and then there were two more closed orbits in like genus three and four, one each. Okay, so that was the whole example, the, the whole list of everything known. Uh, nothing non-trivial known in genus greater than five, except for things commensurable to lower genus. Um, sorry? Uh, no, these ones aren't closed, but they're all actually fairly close to being closed. Um, so now I'll, I'll jump back to the future. So all of these were discovered um, before Eskin Mirzakhani Mohammadi, before the cylinder deformation theorem over there. 
But now jumping back to the present, um, uh, for all of these, let me write it, um, the cylinder deformation theorem. So I'm going to call this the cylinder deformation theorem. Uh, is trivial. Um, and what I mean in particular is in any direction with a cylinder, the surface is covered entirely by parallel cylinders. So like here, I find this one horizontal cylinder, and oh, there's another horizontal cylinder, and the union is the whole thing. But you'll find that there are infinitely many directions where there's a cylinder, and you'll find that in every single direction. It's pretty amazing. It's like an infinitely overdetermined system. It's like a whatever dimensional moduli space. So you expect to be able to come up with this in finitely many directions. But um, uh, Although, um, I mean, I should clarify, the way you prove this for uh, some of these orbit closures is using the cylinder deformation theorem. So maybe it's a little bit not accurate to say that the cylinder deformation theorem is trivial, but ultimately it is. Um, uh, no, that doesn't mean the orbit is closed. Let, let me give you a good example. Um, OK. So take the square, um, and now I want to think about a degree two cover of the square. But now I'm going to branch it over two points. So I can do this with the slit torus construction if I do the same torus for both. Then that'll cover, it'll be a two to one branch cover, branched over two points, whereas before we had covers branched over one point when we were talking about this. So what does the orbit closure look like? I'll tell you, and maybe you'll believe me, but maybe not. I think you should believe me. Um, if you sort of pick everything, if you pick the slit generically, the orbit closure looks like, first of all, you can take these two tori to be anything. And second of all, you take the slit to be anything. OK, because if you, if you pick the two points to be, say, rational points, that wouldn't be the case. Then you, wouldn't get, then you would get a closed orbit. The points could come together in the orbit closure. Um, yeah. uh, so that's an example where you know, somehow it covers a closed orbit, but because there are two branch points, it's not actually a closed orbit. Okay, so this one isn't primitive. Some of these, uh, these eigenform loci are mostly primitive. So it's not obvious they have this behavior, but still they, they have sort of a similar behavior to this example. So it's a, good, it's a good exercise to show if you take any surface with this property and look at any branch cover, it'll still have that property. So you, that, has, that consists of two parts. One, you should show if you have a cylinder um, and you map it here, then it'll map to a cylinder. Um, this is, after all, a covering map away from the branch points. Uh, so it might wrap around a few times, but a cylinder maps to a cylinder. And then you have to show in every direction where this has a cylinder, this is covered by cylinders. But downstairs, you have a cylinder through those points? Oh, not, in the, not through these two points. It's not but there's, you only have to be covered by cylinders in directions that have a cylinder. Well, you can change the direction. Yeah, you can change the direction. So if I put this at a rational slope, then this would have a cylinder, and those cylinders would lift here. And when I had one cylinder, I'd be covered by cylinders. Um, but you know, then I could move the slit, and there'd be no cylinders here, and there'd also be no cylinders upstairs. That's consistent. The special property is that whenever you find a cylinder, there are parallel cylinders covering the surface. But there are plenty of directions. The generic direction has no cylinders. Um, 
you can easily show there are only countably many directions with cylinders. Okay. Other questions? So, um, uh, okay, so even before I talk about this, people saw this, and a lot of people thought, okay, this is it. They weren't, most, most of them were not brave enough to put it in writing, but several of the leading people in the field told me, you know, they thought maybe this was just the complete list of orbit closures. They're so hard to build. They don't seem like they exist. All of the phenomena that we knew were very somehow special leading to orbit closures. And they said, okay, well, maybe this is just everything. Um, which, in a sense, would be a very big success because then it would be very easy to compute the orbit closure of every surface. You have a surface, you'd see, like, does it cover a lower genus surface? Nope. Okay, well, then, first of all, if it's genus bigger than five, then it has dense orbit. Done. Um, and then you could, even in genus two, you'd see, is it on one of these eigenform loci? And then, no? Okay, dense orbit. Um, so it would be very easy to compute orbit closures, which is somehow the goal and somehow what you... Eskin Mirzakhani Mohammadi gives you some results on its own, but to fully exploit it, you need to know the orbit closures. Um, like the, the answer lets, you know, the answer depends on the orbit closure. Um, you know, different sur surfaces with different orbit closures have different properties. So if you ask a general question, you'll get different answers. Um, okay. Yep. Well, so do you care about foliations on the Riemann surface? Measured foliations? Yeah. Do you? I mean, most people who care about Riemann surfaces care about foliations on Riemann surfaces. Yeah, yeah. The singular measured foliations. This is like a big part of the theory of Riemann surfaces. So say you, you care about foliations. Okay, so you can make any foliation be the horizontal foliation of a translation surface. And then you want to know the dynamics of the foliation. Well, it depends on the GL2 orbit closure. You need somehow, you, to understand dynamics on individual surfaces, you understand the whole moduli space. That's somehow a big theme. If you had any sort of topological property and you're given a Riemann surface, you'd want to deform it in a certain way to make it as simple as possible so you could understand it. So from that point of view, you'd always be interested in the orbit and their closure, especially because the limiting things are often the most interesting. But also, I think most people are not just interested in individual Riemann surfaces. Individual Riemann surfaces are important, but even more important is the moduli space of Riemann surfaces. It's the central object. I mean, it's, you know, string theory and algebraic geometry and symplectic geometry and, you know, everything meets at, at the moduli space of Riemann surfaces. I don't think individual Riemann surfaces are as important as the moduli space. And this tells you directly all sorts of things about the moduli space. Okay. So anyways, I was saying some people sort of you know, conjectured this was it. Um, Mirza Khani uh, was braver. She wrote a conjecture down. Her conjecture wasn't quite so broad as that. Okay. So this property, I'm going to call rank one. Okay. Because there is a number you can assign to an orbit closure called rank, and there's a theorem that I proved saying rank one is equivalent to this. Um, so Mirza Khani's conjecture. from about five years ago, all orbit closures of rank bigger than one are trivial. It was certainly supported by the evidence, because in the known orbit closures at the time, everything was either trivial or rank one. 
And remember, whatever rank one is, it's something that holds for all, it's all closed orbits and then all things with sort of similar properties. It's all orbit closures where the cylinder deformation theorem doesn't tell you anything you didn't know already. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so um, this was not an idle conjecture. Uh, she had a whole approach um, to thinking about this, you know, extremely intricate. And I spent um, a year or two working with her fairly intensively on trying to prove this. Um, and something came out of that. Uh, I was always trying to write down the simplest, you know, translation surface with some sort of linear equations that might be a picture of an orbit closure of higher rank, but somehow I couldn't rule it out. Um, and eventually I wrote down something that looks like this. Um, with opposite edges identified. And there were linear equations that went along with this. Um, this guy. Um, so let's start writing things, v0, v1. Or let me say maybe v1, w1. So I, w1 is the golden ratio times v1. And then v2, w2, v3, w3, wi equals golden ratio. So eventually I wrote down this picture of some genus 4 translation surface with some linear equations defined over q adjoined square root 5 that I couldn't show wasn't an orbit closure. Um, and uh, indeed, fast forward to the present. So theorem, uh, Eskin, McMullen, Lucamel, Right, um, there are at least eight primitive uh, rank two orbit closures that are non trivial. And this is one of them. Okay, so this actually took us a very long time to figure out how to prove this. Um, and this wasn't the first example that was figured out. There was a second example I found um, that had some special features. And so just with Kurt McMullen and Ronan Mukamel, not with Alex Eskin, I wrote a paper on that, um, which just appeared in the annals, that showed that that was an orbit closure. Um, and part of the difficulty is you, you, you know, at least what we were doing is we were starting out with some picture like this. And the picture is totally unhelpful. Okay, um, it's, I mean, okay, here's a surface with some linear equations. The problem is, as you sort of continue these linear equations, you might get some subset that sort of dense, that's dense in the, the stratum. And it's just really hard to show that doesn't happen. Um, uh, we had very strong computer evidence in addition to very strong theoretical evidence. Right? You have to have strong theoretical evidence to find this, because how do you pick out equations? I mean, there are infinitely many equations you can write down. So you need some good understanding to um, write this down. Essentially, the reason I could write it down is because Mariam and I were fairly close to proving her conjecture, um, which it's a good thing we didn't, because it's not true. But if you get close to showing that something doesn't exist, you can you know, sometimes just write down an example. That's sometimes what it takes. Um, uh, but anyways, ultimately, the proofs that these are orbit closures are purely algebra geometric. Okay, you take the point of view of algebraic curves, and you build some loci of algebraic curves with differentials that you can verify, uh, that you can sort of compute exactly, like polynomial equations for everything, and you verify that there are linear equations. Okay? And you don't have this picture anywhere in sight, and at the end, you do some truly annoying computation uh, to see that this is in the orbit closure you just constructed. Um, so it's a sort of, 
sort of two orthogonal perspectives. You have like flat geometry and dynamics, which helps you figure out what's there. And once you have it, you try to forget most of what you know about it, um, except for some general properties. And then just start trying to think about algebra geometric constructions that could build such a locus. And then having built it, you try to show it's the locus you thought existed to start. Um, well, so we can actually give equations, um, which I don't want to write for you. Uh, the true insight lies um, in the fact, so these are loci of x omega. Um, and in all of these, um, the Riemann surface has interesting maps to P1. Now, every Riemann surface has maps to P1. But these have low degree maps with dihedral monodromy. Um, and uh, these aren't normal. Uh, these aren't Galois covers. So here there are generally no deck transformations. Sometimes there's an involution. But you can look at the normalization so that this is a Galois cover. Okay, so here you have the deck group acting. Um, and here you pick the omega to be um, some sort of eigenform for something in the deck group. Actually, it's, in the, the, it's an eigenform for something in the group algebra. Um, and the linear equations you get here on the omega, right, so you pick the omega here to be some sort of eigenform for something in the group algebra. And then when you project it down here, it still satisfies those linear equations, even though there's no more automorphisms, no more deck group. Um, and what made this construction really hard to find uh, is that we don't get the loci of all covers. Okay, so there's some sort of special relations that hold among, that have to hold among the branch points for this to work. Okay, so um, actually, it's a construction like this is one of the first things that was tried, and it didn't seem to work. And it, the, you know, the tricky thing is that the branch points are constrained. Um, to, to make it work. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you switch to some other coordinates. So for example, you can specify the branch points here. Um, those are algebraic. Or you can just write down families of algebraic curves. And then you have to check, you know, do they all give different Riemann surfaces? You, you, we don't actually use coordinates on the Hodge bundle. Okay, we just produce algebraic families. So like the most basic example of an algebraic family is something like this. As t varies, this gives you the family of genus 1 Riemann surfaces one of the most famous families in math. Um, so we do something, you know, you can give much more complicated, really quite complicated parameterizations like this. Okay. These are all the uh, rank two examples? Uh, well, actually, we missed two of them until recently which was sort of embarrassing. Two of them were coming from a variant on our construction. And the computer program we wrote to figure out all parameters worked actually found it. But um, it really looked like it was giving trivial orbit closures. And it wasn't until we looked carefully <laughs> that we noticed it was non-trivial orbit closures. Um, it's actually really amazing. So all of these come from unfolding quadrilaterals. So all come from unfolding quadrilaterals. So each of these is the orbit closure of an unfolding of a quadrilateral with some special shape, or some special angles. Um, uh, and Alex Eskin has a computer program that will run some tests on an unfolding of a pro quadrilateral, which doesn't compute the orbit closure, but will provide circumstantial evidence as to what type of orbit closure it has. Um, and uh, Alex's program didn't find any evidence of any additional higher rank orbit closures. Even though it was just doing this sort of very elementary, it involved sort of searching for cylinders, um, 
And you sort of need a lot of theorems to interpret the data, but you can interpret the data. So it didn't find any evidence of any others among unfoldings of quadrilaterals. And yet the proof here is amazingly special. There is no reason that such an orbit closure would have to come from a family of dihedral covers. There's no theoretical reason whatsoever. So it's really quite curious that we have an extremely special seeming proof that seems like it doesn't work, sh shouldn't work all the time, and yet it works in every case where we have any evidence, any computer evidence that it should work. So conceivably, this could be all of them. I really have no, I have lots of conjectures about orbit closures, but I have no conjecture about whether these are the only, um, only higher rank ones, or at least not whether these are the only rank two ones. These are all rank two, it turns out. So can you say what rank is? Well, I didn't say. I just said rank one was equivalent to in any direction with a cylinder, um, you're covered. Rank, if you want, though, I'll tell you the definition because it's pretty easy. Um, so the tangent space to the orbit closure lives naturally in the relative homology group. And the relative homology group maps to the absolute homology group. So you take the tangent space, you map it to absolute homology, and you take half its dimension. That's the rank. Okay, so it's half the dimension, but you exclude some of the dimension, the, sub, the relative part of the dimension. Do they have, can you interpret it geometrically like a... Yeah, yeah, you can interpret it geometrically in terms of sort of how many disjoint independent families of cylinders you can have. Um, Okay, so I want to tell you something else in terms of the geometry um, that we got out of this quite surprisingly. Uh, six of them have dimension uh, eight, and then one has dimension nine, and one has dimension ten. Yeah, but they're they're all. Um, sorry, I got that wrong. Six of them have dimension four, and one has dimension five, and one has dimension six. Two is closed orbits. Yeah, yeah. It's somehow, you can describe some of the deformations with cylinder, so you have more cylinder deformations. You can have cone points come together. Um, so actually, in most of them, you can't just have two cone points together coming together. You have to degenerate the whole surface. So most of them have sort of more complicated degenerations. Yeah, like, or a pair, more than one would get, you'd collapse more than one. Oops. But it's sort of hard to have a good, I mean, we have this algebraic picture of an, well, actually, it's only birational. So we have an algebraic picture of most of these orbit closures. But even so, it's not, it's a little bit hard to really understand the boundary. There are compactifications that are better than Deline Mumford. The ultimate versions are still under construction by people other than me. And that's a fun conversation to have. But I just want to end by saying one other thing. Um, so this theorem with the same authors, uh, again with the same thing that one of them came first, just with Kurt McMullen and Ronan Mukamel. Um, there are totally geodesic complex surfaces in M13, M14, and M21. So here these are moduli spaces, say, of genus 1 surfaces with three marked points, genus 1 surfaces with four marked points, etc. So these are uh, complex dimension two things. And you should think of these as um, analogs of uh, what are called Teichmuller curves. So in general, you have these Teichmuller disks that wind around densely in MG. But sometimes they actually close up and form an algebraic curve. These are the projections of the closed GL2 orbits. Um, uh, and those Teichmuller curves are totally geodesic of dimension one. Uh, and these are the first non-trivial examples we know of things of totally geodesic of dimension bigger than one. Uh, 
in the Teichmuller metric. It's the Teichmuller metric that's connected to GL2R because uh, GL2R orbits project to Teichmuller to complex geodesics for the Teichmuller metric. Um, and you can also have in mind now that it's the Kobayashi metric. So this is really exceptional behavior for Kobayashi. Yeah. We're having totally geodesic complex surfaces. Yeah. For example, we don't know if there are three points whose convex hull in the Kobayashi metric is like all of Teichmuller space. So it's a sort of, we don't really understand the convexity properties very well. Um, so it's sort of surprising to find these totally geodesic things. Yeah? So these are not foliated by Teichmuller curves. No. They are foliated by Teichmuller disks. Um, so maybe I'll end just by saying the, a result that I proved on my own that contrasts these totally geodesic things of, of higher dimension to totally geodesic things of dimension one. So totally geodesic of dimension one is a Teichmuller disk. So it's a manifold in Teichmuller space, the universal cover of MG. There are tons of them. You can join any two points. And then you project them to MG, and typically it's dense. Right? But sometimes it covers a Teichmuller curve, and that actually happens infinitely often. It's some countable infinite set of Teichmuller disks that cover different Teichmuller curves. So now we say, OK, what happens with higher dimensional totally geodesic things, these higher dimensional versions of Teichmuller disks that we now know examples exist? So I was able to show that the opposite occurs. So first of all, every totally geodesic submanifold in Teichmuller space covers a variety. So it's the analog of the totally false statement every Teichmuller disk covers a Teichmuller curve. And there are only finitely many, which is the analog of the totally false statement there are only finitely many Teichmuller curves. Um, and so this result was proven using joint work with Alex Eskin and Simeon Philip, in which we compute something called the algebraic hull of the conservative storage co-cycle, um, which is somehow a very powerful result uh, which let us do something we're really not supposed to be able to do, which is really understand things in the universal cover really well, um, where you don't see the dynamics as much. Okay, so I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Any questions? I like questions. So, so, is this something you said much earlier on, like, the image of you have the GL to our orbit, or the orbit structure, and it's going to be projected to be dense? Yeah, GL to our orbits. So, GL to our orbits. Did I mention something here that we project here? Yeah, so before I said the GT orbits, so the GT action is ergodic. So, if you take even just GT, e to the t0, 0, 0 minus, e to the t0, 0, 0, e to the minus t. Even that orbit will be dense in the unit area locus of the stratum. So say take the principal stratum, which is the big dimensional one. So then you can project that to mg. Well, if you take a dense set and you project it to mg, you again get a dense set. It's one dimensional, just the GT orbit. So already that one dimensional thing projected to mg is dense. And so then if you take the GL2 orbit, that's even bigger. So it's still dense when you project it. Yeah. yeah, so the density upstairs is actually stronger than the density in MG. Uh, six, seven, or eight dimensional, yeah. Most of them are six, or sorry, four, I don't know what I'm having numbers today, four, five, or six dimensional. Most of them are four dimensional. It's, you get a three dimensional variety. Ah, yeah, so that's interesting. But uh, those are not the moduli spaces where you find those. So these guys in, and notice I said eight there, and I only have three examples there. So in three of the examples is an involution. And you quotient by an involution and mark the poles of the resulting quadratic differentials. And you lose another dimension. And you get a, a geodesic surface. So actually, whether or not an orbit closure gives you a totally geodesic variety, um, you first need an involution. And then you quotient by the involution, and then it's just a dimension count. <laughs>
you need the or GL2 orbit closure to be twice the complex dimension of the resulting variety in MGN that you get. Yeah? Um, so one thing I didn't have time to talk about, or I chose not to because maybe this isn't the audience, but um, when, when Simeon Phillips showed that orbit closures are varieties, he actually showed that they're cut out by um, conditions involving the Jacobian. So endomorphism, the Jacobian torsion conditions, and the Jacobian twisted torsion conditions. Um, so at the very least, it's, it's clear that um, uh, um, you know, these are cut out by sort of algebraic conditions. Uh, in a sense, you can think that these orbit closures witness unlikely intersections. Um, if you look at a loci in the moduli of PPAV, of abelian varieties, where the Jacobian has special properties, this is some nice, you know, homogeneous space. Um, and then you intersect it with MG, and, you know, by a naive dimension count, you expect the dimension to be wrong, to be small. Um, and so in here, it's like the dimension is bigger than, than sort of you would expect it to be. But even more than that, some of these are very interesting. Like, this one was the one that we wrote up uh, with Kurt and, that Kurt and uh, Ronan and I wrote up. And it's a beautiful story with the classical geometry of cubic curves. Um, Hessians, Kalians. We cite a book from like the 1800s uh, with some of the formulas that we use. Uh, has there been a lot of number theory application? There, any? there has not as I know been any number theory application, but um, there is hope that some of some orbit closures will give rise to interesting modular forms. Well, we already know they give rise to interesting modular forms, but they haven't been used to like construct Galois representations or anything like that. I don't know that the number theorists really care that much. Um, there are reverse applications. Number theory gets applied to this a lot. Um, so for example, Ronan is thinking about Teichmuller curves and characteristic P. Um, and you know, obviously, anytime Hilbert modular surfaces come up, you'll have number theory lurking in the background. Uh, and some Diophantine you know, approximation results has played a role in some of this story. Yeah. What, what, where, where will it go? Oh, we can continue the conversation. Uh,